My name is Kelly Thompson. My name is Louise Makovsky. Roderick Kenneth McLeod. My name is Stephanie Iron. Lorraine O'Donnell. My maiden name is Beverly Johnson. My name is Ian Ferrier. My name is Janet Lum. My name is Maura McKeown. This is the first episode of Elan's Waves of Change project about identity and belonging in the English-speaking communities of Quebec. The people you are going to meet here are descendants of some of the earliest English speakers who settled in this territory when it was Lower Canada, the United Provinces of Canada, or La Belle Province du Québec. They'll be talking about why their families chose to immigrate here, why they stayed during the decades of linguistic tensions when so many others left, and how they feel about being English speakers living in Quebec today. Let's hear what they have to say. On my mother's side, my mother's name was Parkinson, and her uh, grandfather, he came from Lancashire, and he arrived in the 1820s approximately uh, in Rawdon. My great-great-grandfather came from St. Thomas in 1846. My uh, ancestor Frank Johnson, he wanted to be an actor, but his grandfather said, because you like to travel, I'm going to pay your way around the world for as long as you want. So he sailed around the world for two years before setting foot on land. And then he came to Quebec and settled on Nickel Road up in Lennoxville, up on a hill, and he started a farm. In his biography, he said, on the long winter nights of Lower Canada, that's when he would write his poetry. Yeah. I have all his books of poetry. He was an adventurer. My uh, farming ancestors uh, from the lowlands of Scotland uh, encountered very few problems. Uh, culturally, a fairly well-established Scottish community already. They came because Montreal was a booming city. There were a lot of Irish people here already. Because it was a big port, a big city, and they saw a lot of land, and I guess it was Canada. They were just happy to be in Canada. I think as to why they chose Montreal, Montreal was a massive fixture in Canada at the time, uh, and it had both a large English community and a large French community. When my ancestors arrived, there was roughly an equal number of English and French in Montreal, and Montreal was very much their community, although the French became uh, a bigger majority with time. How strongly does Montreal feel like home to you? There was a very, very strong community within the church. We're talking about a lot of visible minorities who were able to get together and do advocacy and so forth within their um, religious community. Definitely the Chinese community and the creation of Chinatown was based off of that need to have that support. Um, for sure, the church also played some role, but it primarily is the community, Chinese community, yeah. Within the Jewish community, there were agencies that were helping people at the time, but there wasn't, there wasn't a lot. And the fear of poverty, the fear of being homeless and without food, I mean, it was a real fear. And it stayed with my grandfather his whole life. With my, my maternal grandfather's family, they were Methodists, so maybe I think that they had a strong church affiliation. And um, as it happened, uh, one of her descendants, uh, uh, Douglas Smith became the, uh, the moderator of the United Church of Canada, so there was a strong Methodist leaning. And I know that church was um, the center of, of, of the Scottish community for those years. Um, I also think that as farmers, they, um, they, they interacted a lot, the different farmers in the different rows. I think they, they traded ideas about, about crops and, and techniques and so forth. Uh, my... Uh, original ancestor in the early part of the 19th century that uh, I have some description of, I think, interacted a lot uh, with fr francophone neighbors uh, who owned different farms. This is 
what's now NDG? When we moved from Norton, when I was just finished grade one, we moved to what was called Rang Saint Remy. Now it's called Sources Boulevard in the West Island. My great grandfather went to work when he first arrived in a factory and there was a factory fire. The doors were locked and he was killed. And my grandfather began, uh, became the man of the house and started working at the age of 12. Well, my grandfather went to work as a teenager to support his family with a horse and wagon, and he went across the Quebec countryside as a peddler. And at that time, there were a lot of Jewish people doing the same thing, a lot of Jewish men, and they were called les Juifs. And it wasn't anti-Semitic, it was just you need a pot and pan, you get it from les Juifs. And uh, he, felt, he felt very close to his customers, he spoke only French, his English was very poor, but his children were not allowed to be educated in French because as Jews we were barred from the Catholic schools. How strongly do you feel you belong in Quebec? Now, when we lived on Rang uh, Saint Remy, our neighbors was Asim Levin on one side, and Emilien Laniel on the other side. And me and, and my sisters and brother used to help the Laniel family pick their vegetables, wrap them in bundles, because the Laniel family had to get all these vegetables onto the back of their truck and at Atwater Market for five o'clock in the morning. So with these kids, we learned French. The street I lived on, I lived on High Street, and when I was growing up, there, there were no French families there. There was one, as uh, I got a little older, there was a family uh, b by the name of uh, Giroux. They spoke English, and uh, the father spoke English, the children spoke, and they went to Eng English school. I graduated uh, from Not Notre Dame, but was the English division high school, and I had a very, very, very low level French, because it wasn't important. Uh, when I went to Bishop's, I took uh, one, uh, one of my courses was in French. And my grandmother, who spoke like five languages, I remember her telling me things like, I want to speak with the French people. And I went into the store and I wanted to ask them, I need lemon. And she said, and the guy couldn't understand the word lemon. So she raced through her mind in the five languages. And I think it was German, she said, they call it titron. You have a titron? So they, that's how they got along. I know one anecdote from, um, I guess this would be maybe the 1920s, uh, of a great aunt who famously was trying to communicate with um, one of the same neighbor families, I guess, Francophone neighbor families, urgently trying to prepare a, a probably Christmas dinner or something and said, uh, avez-vous le stale bread pour stuffer le turkey? That was, you know, that's the kind of lack of integration that took place so <laughs> they were trying I guess but yeah. even though by law they were supposed to allow um, children of other religions in the schools they didn't so all the Jewish kids end up going to Protestant school if they went to public school they told me they we wanted to go to French school because the French people were friendlier to us but then they ended up having to turn towards and becoming part of the English community which was very good for them um, but it was because of that. And they spoke like about five languages. So language was, they didn't understand why these were barriers. One of these weird things about um, some aspect of the Protestant school system back in the 50s, they, they hired a whole lot of Scots out of Scotland. Um, I, I had teachers, if you spoke to them in, in English, they had very thick Scottish accents, um, but they were teaching French. And what was much more interesting, um, I had a number of teachers from, uh, from the Middle East uh, from North Africa. So it was an interesting, uh, broad experience. Um, I even spent a, a year with an almost entirely Francophone Jewish uh, teachers. Um, but uh, only in my very last year of high school was there a, a um, French Catholic substitute teacher. And I emphasize Catholic because that was the reason why they couldn't teach in the Protestant school system. And we had a, an amazing day because she spent the whole time talking to us about Joal. And we didn't know that there was a world out there that uh, that sounded that that different from what we'd learned in school so yeah I think that's 
that says a lot about the, uh, again, the two solitudes. It's really changed uh, during my lifetime. Uh, I think uh, growing up in, in, in the Montreal I grew up in, it was quite possible to uh, continue in the English language and never touch the French language except for peripherally. Um, that didn't particularly happen to me because I, I was going to a school which was uh, segregated uh, with French on one side and English on, on the other side and uh, near the Twain shall meet except for, for, uh, for uh, who's going to play uh, uh, capture the flag at recess or something like that and we would have two teams because of that. But I think until, uh, until later in my life, um, I guess... I mean, I, I think of uh, the revolution here uh, in the rise of the Parti Québécois, uh, René Lévesque, is a really defining moment uh, where the, uh, and it was where I began to understand how uh, the French community felt about their place in the society here. Well, I grew up in an atmosphere where we were all mixed and many backgrounds, so you learned as many languages as possible. And... Um, so some people, their first languages were Slavic languages, Chinese, uh, but we all learned English so that we could all communicate and we were all told and learn your French. I remember being uh, older, like young 20s, and I would have a French boyfriend. He would speak completely in French and I would speak completely in English and we would understand each other. And people would look at us like, how come you two are speaking two different languages? But that was normal. And I, and I found it great. And I used to find Montreal. We traveled around the world as a, when I was a child. And I used to go, Montreal is the best place because we're bilingual. Well, I'm very proud that I was one of the first students that was um, in the French immersion program in the Protestant school system. And unfortunately, it started at age 12, which is a bit late to learn a second or a third language. Um, but my curriculum was accelerated before that so that I could start at grade seven to have only in French all the basic subjects. and. Uh, it was an honor, and I never felt like I had to learn French. I wanted to. I was very motivated. When I came to Montreal, um, I took a course. Uh, to, I got a certificate from McGill in uh, 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 French conversation. And then, um, as a teacher, because I was a um, Canadian history teacher, and because I uh, wanted in the 80s to uh, really improve my French, um, I went to the University of Montreal and I uh, took a diploma in uh, Quebec studies. I, all the lectures were in French and um, I wrote some of my exams in English and some in French, but I, it wasn't uh, complete fluency. My son was born in 93, uh, my daughter in 96 and uh, and they were going to they were, they went to elementary school in French and uh, our whole social milieu was a Cateau Mont Royal and uh, I had to learn a lot more French a lot uh, quickly to so I could help them with their math homework and and whatever else and it was a real um, uh, it was for my my wife at the time uh, Lucy spoke French extremely well uh, and I learned uh, to speak French a lot better at that time and and to really integrate into the French community here. One thing that you might find sort of humorous, um, I find that uh, our present Premier Legault, to my ear, speaks a perfect French for me. I find that he, he speaks uh, well and, and slowly, and so I can understand. But there are other times when I, I can't understand, I find it hard. How strongly do you feel you belong in Canada? There's a very pre like prevalent narrative of the rich Anglo, the Anglo boss. Um, there is some truth to that. And my own ancestors who were poor um, were not bosses, but they definitely benefited on the English speaking side from the fact that there were bosses who spoke English and that there were businesses operating in English. But um, 
what I find is it's too there, there, in the media, um, in history books, it, there's too often reference only to the wealthy elite, the the one percent of the English speakers, as if they represented everyone. I think that's a heavy burden, and it has to go. It's my first year teaching, and um, of course we did have uh, the bomb threats, uh, but. Frankly, there were so many of them, it became sort of normal. I mean, awful, th I mean, awful thing to say, but they, they were more threats. I mean, if I, if I go back to uh, grade two or grade three, I remember being told that I could no longer walk to school. It was a, an eight or a 10 block walk because uh, mailboxes were blowing up in our neighborhood. So that was probably my first, uh, first um, experience with that. And I, it just, I had no idea where that was coming from. I remember, of course, the, um, the famous um, kidnapping of Cross. That, 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 that's, that's when I think it affected me. I lived um, on Penfield at the time, and I was teaching at Darcy McGee, and I remember walking along uh, Dr. Penfield, uh, and sometimes on Pine, and seeing, uh, seeing the guards, the soldiers, out, you know, and that was, I found, intimidating. I guess fast forward to when I was in high school uh, and all of a sudden uh, uh, James Cross was kidnapped and the, the Rose Brothers uh, uh, kidnapped um, Pierre Laporte was his name. I think I was in grade 9 or grade 10 then and um, I remember a friend of mine, uh, René Balsay, uh, walking down a street to go visit a friend of his in, in, uh, in Westmount and being uh, accosted by uh, military uh, from BC, you know, asking what are you doing here, who are you? Uh, what, uh, what do you, who are you going to see, and all of these questions, and then, and then uh, a whole uh, slew of people being thrown in jail uh, because of the uh, uh, of the FLQ crisis. Um, so that had a, a big effect on me too. Uh. I have a national perspective. It was specifically the language of French because the rest of Canada was so uh, English speaking. So it was the actual language and the, the conflict in the political, cultural conflict that drew me to Quebec. I remember at one point in my life, because I'd always been called like, hey, you, take care, uh, English or whatever. I'm, I'm not, it's not always negative. Like, I was very happy to be bilingual and know many languages, you know, and I had open arms for everybody as long as you're a nice person. But at one point I was walking in the street and I went, why did that person call me a take care, you know, and Anglo? I said, I don't have an ounce of English blood in me. It's Slovak, Chinese, French, Scottish, and whatever, maybe Russian, I don't know. And it made me realize that it's because of the language that someone's talking to me like that. So there's, there's a huge misunderstanding of why we're speaking English. And it's got nothing to do with our blood for a lot of us, you know? Where do I not feel at home? And I think that happens in every part of this beautiful city when people immediately ask me, what island are you from? And I have to respond, the island of Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the idea that um, only French Canadians were repressed or suppressed economically, politically, um, in Canada, every ethnic group was you know barred from jobs. Um, my uncle, who graduated top of his class at McGill in, in physics, took two years to find a job. Um, so as Jews, we we're used to being excluded. It doesn't surprise us from every country. It's, it's been our experience. Um, but here in Canada, I think, um, I mean, I, I should say here in Quebec, I think that it was the way that a lot of people were suppressed here. And it was not only French Canadians. And now I think the playing field is, is starting to level out for women, for ethnic groups, for everybody, you know. There might be negative stories about the English speakers, but there are very positive stories about the Irish. Um, there's a long history of very positive interactions between the Irish and the French, uh, well, what used to be called French Canadian populations. Um, including in media, very positive understanding of everyone's Irish for a day on the day of the St. Patrick's Parade. So uh, 
it's it's definitely not all bleak for some of the sub communities that make up the uh, the English speaking communities. I'm irritated when I hear that there's this war between the English and the French, and they don't want to learn each other's language, they don't want to socialize. Or uh, when I'm in the comedy community. Uh, to me, that's the greatest example. And we see, you know, Sugar Sammy and Mike Ward and Derek Seguin, who've built careers in both languages, um, have strengthened their, their, um, their abilities in both languages. And I see that among the, the children that, I, that, I, that I've taught as well. I mean, they're, able, they're so able to go back and forth among the languages that they speak. And to me, that, that's the future. That's really where we should be heading. And, when people are only allowed to learn one language, uh, to me, you're being you're being shut off from a lot of richness, a lot of a lot of um, growing, you know. And what I've noticed in Montreal is people don't want to speak to each other because we're afraid of what language we're going to speak to each other, and we don't want to be rude to each other because we don't really want to be rude. But what if it's English French and that person doesn't like English or doesn't like French? I love Montreal because of uh, the social democracy that's part of my politics. And also being an artist and in the arts, um, there's a lot of support for the arts. So that's what is keeping me in Quebec, in Montreal. I am feeling extremely optimistic. I am fortunate enough to have an aunt who was appointed the first black judge here in Quebec. And despite the fact that McGill came with his slaves, I graduated from McGill with distinction. I am so optimistic. The struggle will build my resilience and we'll keep going until we can't go anymore. I have mixed feelings. Um, I do, I, I do. Uh, optimistic because um, I believe I could make a happy life here. Um, pessimistic because I think we're heading into some politically stormy periods that are unnecessarily divisive. And um, while uh, I have plenty of um, gumption and plan to put my two cents in when these discussions arise, uh, I know that it's not always going to be easy. And I find um, a lot of the discussions are very draining and get away from some of the issues that people have been raising that have to do more with humanity and bigger issues facing humanity. I would like to see Anglos um, stick, out, stick, stick up for the English language and English culture in Quebec. I would like to see more Anglos be um, a little more militant. I would like them, uh, but, but, but not disrespectful but uh, not to just cave in and give up and uh, to be a little more vocal about the very rich heritage we have in Quebec for all concerned. One of the reasons that English speakers have not been more vocal about their heritage is that they have always been a diverse and divided lot. There was never a single community of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the mythical waspy second solitude. English speakers have been Catholic, Celtic, Black, Jewish, and Chinese. It is true that a great deal of wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few English-speaking families that lived in Montreal's Golden Square Mile, but they were not even 1% of the Anglo population, back at a time when half of Montreal was English-speaking. The English, Irish, and Scottish communities each had their own institutions, which is why the Rose, the Shamrock, and the Thistle have featured on Montreal's coat of arms since 1842. Black history in Quebec goes back to Nouvelle France. Later, large numbers of English speakers arrived in the 1880s, when Canada's new national railroads recruited black employees from the US and the West Indies. They made their homes in the area now known as Little Burgundy. The Union Church was founded in 1907 and still stands today as a landmark near the corner of Atwater and Notre Dame. During the US Prohibition years, Americans flooded into Montreal for alcohol and jazz. Some of the hottest nightclubs, like Rockhead's Paradise, were in Little Burgundy, 
where hometown legend Oscar Peterson was born. The first Jewish synagogue in Montreal was established in 1768. Its founders came from Spain and Portugal. At the end of the 19th century, a large wave of immigration fled Eastern Europe, increasing Montreal's Jewish population to 60,000. These immigrants made Yiddish the third most prevalent language in Montreal. In many ways, they constituted a third solitude, adding a new language and religion to the mix. Chinese immigrants formed yet another distinct community. In 1902, the area officially known as Chinatown became home to Chinese-owned businesses, notably specialty grocers, laundries, and restaurants that catered to the Chinese community and the rest of Montreal. Yiddish speakers established a tradition of eating Chinese food at Christmas. Montreal has been defined as divided between French and English by St. Lawrence Boulevard. It was never that simple. The suburb of Rosemont on the east side was 30% English speaking in the years prior to the Quiet Revolution. That represented about 50,000 English speakers who built schools and churches in the area they called Rosemount. I lived in Rosemont in the 1980s, and apart from a few silent churches, you would never guess that it had so recently been home to a thriving English speaking community. A couple of years ago, I moved to Outremont, which I had always thought of as being the home to Quebec's French-speaking elite. Soon after arriving, I was surprised to read in Le Journal d'Outremont that during the Victorian era, Outremont was 80% English and only became majoritarily French in the 1930s. This was hard to believe until I looked at a map and saw the street names, Bloomfield, Fern Hill, Hazelwood, Maplewood, Spring Grove, Stewart, McCullough, McEachran, McDougall, and McNider. Sounds like a district in Edinburgh. The contributions that English speakers have made to the development of Quebec are considerable. It is often dismissed as an imposition by a wealthy foreign elite. But that's not the way the middle class and the working class families remember the history. I hope to see you again for episode two of Waves of Change. Thank you.